I'm going to start with pediatric femoral shaft fractures. It's important to remember when managing this condition to maintain a high suspicion for child abuse. It's particularly important in patients before walking age. It's an important testable fact that femurs of fractures are the second most common child abuse associated fractures after humerus fractures. And we see a bimodal distribution of these fractures. There's an increased rate in toddlers. And then again, that rate increases in adolescents. The mechanism of fracture correlates with pace and age. So in those toddlers, the most common mechanism is a fall. And in the adolescents, the most common mechanism is high energy trauma. And that could be a motor vehicle collision or a pedestrian struck. But if you have an older patient presenting with a fracture after minor trauma, think about a pathologic process such as a bone tumor or osteogenesis imperfecta. For example, in the image to the right, we see a lucency around the fracture site, which was found later to be during treatment to be secondary to fibrous dysplasia, which was taken into account at the time of surgical treatment. When managing these fractures, you want to describe them similar to other fractures. Is it transverse, comminuted, or a spiral? And how long is that spiral? And then you want to know whether it's open or closed. We also state whether femur fractures are length stable. Those are typically transverse or short oblique. And then whether they're length unstable. And those typically are spiral or comminuted. Length unstable can also be classified if the fracture length or the spiral length is more than twice the bone diameter. And that's particularly important in the 5 to 11 age group when you're choosing an implant. Femur fractures will present with thigh pain and of course an inability to walk. Examination shows gross deformity, shortening, or swelling of the thigh. Standard radiographs are AP and lateral views of the femur and that will allow you to describe the fracture. But it can be important to obtain ipsilateral hip and knee films to rule out associated injuries. For example, in the x-ray to the right, the patient has a femoral shaft fracture, but don't be satisfied with your search and miss the proximal femur fracture as well. Treatment of femoral shaft fractures in kids is based on the age and size of the patient as well as the fracture pattern. And the guidelines provided by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, clinical practice guidelines in 2009, are still applicable today. Let's get started with some questions before we use those, before we review those treatment guidelines. So here's one question. Pavlik harness treatment is appropriate for which of the following? A four-year-old with a diaphyseal femur fracture and a neuromuscular disorder, a two-month-old with a diaphyseal femur fracture, a nine-month-old with a femur fracture less than two centimeters short, a patient of the same age, nine months old, but the fracture is more than two centimeters short, and a four-year-old with a femur fracture, closed head injury, and chest trauma. And the answer is number two, a two-month-old with that diaphyseal femur fracture. And the reason is that the Pavlik harness or a spica cast are good options for patients less than six months of age with femoral shaft fractures. The reason for that is although, although the Pavlik doesn't line up the fracture perfectly, you are able to obtain significant remodeling in this age group. Spica casts are an option as well but certainly have more skin complications than the Pavlik harness does. Let's look at another question. Titanium elastic nails are appropriate for which of the following? Similar patients, a two-month-old with a femur fracture, 26-month-old with a femur fracture, a 10-year-old boy who weighs 35 kilos and has a highly comminuted fracture, 10-year-old boy, 35 kilos, and a transverse fracture, and then a 10-year-old boy who's 51 kilos and has a transverse mid-shaft fracture. And so the answer is the 10-year-old boy, 35 kilos, and a transverse fracture. And the reason for that is titanium elastic nails is appropriate for patients 5 to 11, perhaps older, as long as they're less than 100 pounds, with length-stable fractures. Relatively contraindicated in highly comminuted fractures or otherwise unstable fractures. Another question, immediate hip spica casting for femur fractures is most appropriate for which age group? Two-month-old, 26-month-old, three-day-old with a hip dislocation, a nine-year-old boy, and a 12-year-old girl? And the answer is number two, the 26-month-old. And so according to the AOS guidelines, children six months to five years of age are most appropriate for the spica cast treatment. So let's look at those guidelines more closely in terms of patient age. 
so less than six months of age, any fracture pattern, your options are pavlic harness or, or, or early spica cast. Six months to five years, with less than two centimeters of shortening, the best option is the early spica cast. Now, in the same age group, if you have more than two to three centimeters of shortening, you can think about additional options. However, the AOS guidelines found no data which supported changing your treatment plan if there's more shortening. I think the most important thing to do is know that the fracture has more shortening when you apply the cast, follow them closely, and be ready to change your treatment at the first follow-up visit. Other indications for options other than the spica cast include polytrauma, multiple fractures, and open fractures, and those options are submuscular plates, flexible nails, external fixators, and sometimes traction with delayed spica casting. In patients 5 to 11 years of age, if it's length stable, transverse or oblique, which makes it length stable, utilize a flexible nail. In the same age group for length unstable, again, comminuted or long spiral, fracture length more than twice the bone diameter, or very proximal, very distal fractures, think about submuscular plates. External fixators are good options for polytrauma patients for damage control. If the patients are 11 years or greater, and they weigh less than 100 pounds, you can still use flexible nails. There are some studies, though, that have concerns about flexible nails in older patients, so that's important to know. Usually, you're going to want to use a solid nail. Um, here's the study which did raise concerns about the, that age group. Uh, so Moreau's et al. in 2006 showed worse outcomes with titanium elastic nails, so not all um, intramedullary nails. They did not use stainless nails in pediatric patients that were either 11 or older or weighed more than uh, 49 kilograms. Now, patient weighs more than 100 pounds, an anti-grade nail with a trochanteric or lateral entry starting point is a great option. It's important to measure your x-rays in advance to make sure that your nail is not too large. But nowadays, the nails go down to fairly small sizes, so it's not an issue. And then again, very proximal or distal fractures, think about submuscular plates. So those 2009 guidelines were quite helpful, but there was only one grade A and one grade B recommendation. The grade A recommendation was that children less than 36 months of age with a femoral shaft fracture should be evaluated for child abuse. That doesn't mean we have to call Child Protective Services on every patient less than 36 months with a femur fracture. It does mean we do a history and physical looking for signs and symptoms of abuse and proceed according to application. You can utilize the straps to manipulate the fracture into the right ballpark. Complications include femoral nerve compression if you, hip, if you flex the hip too much, just like with a padlet for DDH, and perhaps a greater risk in this setting because the thigh is already swollen. Even though the pavlik immobilizes the hips to some extent, they can still extend their knees uh, to a small degree, and so that you should be able to detect a quadriceps injury or weakness from a femoral nerve praxia. Immediate spica casts are great for six children six months to five years of age, such as this spiral fracture here, relatively contraindicated in polytrauma or open, fract open fractures. We discussed that the AOS didn't think you need to change treatment plans if you have shortening more than two, three centimeters. But as I said, certainly be thinking about that during your treatment so that you're ready to change plans if you notice excess shortening during follow-up. Spica casts are applied with reduction under sedation or general anesthesia. You can use a single leg spica as shown on the image to the far right or a one and a half spica as shown above. If it's just a distal femoral buckle, a long leg cast is probably okay. There are some differences in the way these casts are applied. Whereas the 1.5 spica cast shown above focuses more on sitting with the hips closer to 90 degrees in flexion, the single leg spica or the walking spica flexes the hip and the knee to a similar amount so that after a few weeks in the spica, the child can stand and even walk a bit. The walking spica is probably easier to tolerate. A study from JBJS in 2011 showed that the walking spica cast was just as effective as the 1.5 spica cast, 
but had a lower care burden for the families. Another study, JPO 2010, showed that spica casts applied in the emergency room worked just as well as those applied in the operating room, but when applying in the emergency room had less delay for, for cast application and of course a lower cost. When you're applying the cast, you need to limit your compression through the popliteal fossa and really not put any compression in the popliteal fossa. Years ago, it was described to apply a short leg cast and then pull traction through that area, but that puts too much stressure on the stress on the vascular structures and may result in a compartment syndrome. So this figure to the right is essentially showing you what not to do. When following these fractures after cast application, remember the tolerances for femur fractures in this age group. Accept up to 10 degrees of angulation in the coronal plane and 20 degrees in the sagittal plane with minimal malrotation. This picture shows a bar between the legs. You don't have to do that, but certainly if you do, or even if you don't, spica car seats are often required. Those car seat programs take a lot of work for hospitals to keep active, whether it's cleaning the casts or renting the casts, and some of them have difficulty getting the car seats back. I know of one center that won't remove the cast until the car seat is returned. You have to do what you have to do, I guess. Follow-up is important after you place the spica cast. We need to do weekly radiographs for the first two to three weeks to rule out early displacement. And cast wedging is a useful tool if you see an, an early progression towards a malunion. Healing times are from four to eight weeks based on age. A nice rule of thumb is age plus three. This is a great paper from the University of Pennsylvania Orthopedic Journal describing a technique for cast wedging. And it's available as a free PDF online. An important complication of spica cast is compartment syndrome, and you can decrease that risk by applying smooth contours around the popliteal fossa, limiting knee flexion to less than 90 degrees, and avoiding excess traction. And a, a good thing to do is to leave the foot out so you can watch their neurovascular function. So let's look at a test question. A three-year-old boy sustains the injury down in figure three, a, fire, a spiral fracture of the, distal, of the femoral shaft, and then 24 hours later is agitated, needs more analgesia, and is not moving his left toes. All the followings may lead to this condition, except spica casting with the knee flexed more than 105 degrees, immediate cast placement in the emergency room, initial placement of a short leg cast with skin traction to aid in reduction, a firm cast mold in the popliteal fossa, and high energy injury. And so, of course, the key word in that stem was accept, and immediate cast placement in the emergency room is not associated with an increased risk of compartment syndrome, and as we looked at in that earlier paper, had just as good results as those done in the operating room. Traction and delayed spica casting is not done nearly as often uh, these days, but if you see lots of shortening or you have other concerns, it it can be done for children six months uh, to five years of age. If you do utilize traction, remember that the traction pin goes in the distal femur, uh, just proximal to the physis, rather than the proximal tibia. And the reason for that is that um, cases of growth arrest with subsequent recurvatum have been noted with traction pins placed in the tibia. So when you do a traction pin and then place the child in traction for a few weeks, you achieve early callus, and then it's safe to place them in a spica with less concern for further shortening. Flexible nails are indicated for length stable fractures in kids 5 to 11 years of age and perhaps in adolescent patients that are still less than 100 pounds with length stable fractures. Flexible nails allow for load sharing and quick mobilization. They come in multiple sizes and what you'll want to do is take your radiograph Determine the isthmus and use two nails that are each 0.4 or 40% of that isthmus. And those nails are usually inserted retrograde two centimeters above the distal femoral physis. These fractures treated with flexible nails take about 10 to 12 weeks to heal. You don't necessarily need to remove the nails, but if you do, it's safe to do so between six months and 
and 12 months afterwards. The pliers in the flexible nail set allow for easy removal as they grasp right around the flexible nail. The most common complication of flexible nails is pain at the insertion site. You don't have to leave the nail out quite this far as shown in the radiograph here. It's been recommended to leave the nail out less than 25 millimeters. Uh, remember that there is an increased rate of complications with titanium flexible nails in patients 11 uh, years or older or those who weigh more than 50 kilograms. Submuscular plates are great for comminuted or length unstable fractures. They also can be helpful for very proximal, very distal fractures. The technique involves a provisional reduction, usually with closed or percutaneous methods, and then sliding the plate between the vastus lateralis and the periosteum on the lateral aspect of the femur. Even though the children are small, a 4.5 plate usually fits. You want three screws distal and three screws proximal to the fracture site. And weight bearing is usually restricted until you see callus formation. Advantage of these submuscular plates is early mobility and a biologically friendly technique. There is somewhat of a steep learning curve if you're doing it in a truly minimally invasive fashion. And also, there's going to be stress risers after removal of the hardware. And so you'll need to uh, limit the patient's activities until you see healing of those screw holes. Now, anti-grade rigid nails are indicated for patients 11 years or older. Uh, they can work in length unstable fractures, and they also work in patients more than 100 pounds. We use a greater trochanter or lateral entry nail, which decreases the risk of avascular necrosis from a piriformis entry nail. These nails, of course, don't cross the distal physis of the femur. In your practice, you may do or you may have seen locked intramedullary nails placed in patients younger than 12 years of age, and certainly that's been reported. This study from Memphis showed, pa showed nails effectively used in patients uh, seven years and older. So important to know uh, that that can be used. Just be sure to measure the isthmus before you decide to place a locked nail and make sure you have a nail that's small enough. Currently, there's nails available as low as seven millimeters in size, but also 8.2 starting with one company eight, and 8.5 starting with another company. So lots of different options out there. All of these options allow interlocking screws and permit early weight bearing. Now it is important to know whether you're doing a lateral entry nail or a greater trochanteric entry nail and to insert the nail the way it's designed. So check the technique guide before you're using the nail look exactly where that nail was designed to be placed and place it in the same spot. Complications of intramedullary nails include an AVN risk of 1 to 2 percent with a piriformis start. It's not completely clear what that rate of AVN is in trochanteric or lateral entry nails. External fixators are not used as often anymore for femur fractures in kids. But good indications remain damage control orthopedics, open fractures, femur fractures with vascular injuries. The external fixator is applied laterally and avoids the quad, usually stays on 10 to 16 weeks, which is a while, and some can even weight bear. They do have more complications than internal fixation, particularly pin track infections, usually treated with oral antibiotics and pin sites care, but still it is a complication. But the most important complication of an external fixator for a femur fracture is refracture. And that's really devastating. The child has worn their fixator, it's removed, and then they have to go through it all over again. An important complication of a pediatric femur fracture is a leg length discrepancy. One type of that is overgrowth. So actually, kids between 2 and 10 years of age will overgrow by 0 0.7 to 2 centimeters. So that's important when you're doing a spica cast to allow for a little bit of overgrowth so that they level out over time and end up relatively the same in limb length. Shortening is another problem. Two to three centimeters is going to be okay in that age group because they will overgrow. However, if it's more than two to three centimeters, overgrowth probably won't be enough to accommodate for that. And so if you see that early in treatment, think about changing your treatment plan. So here's a question, 14-year-old boy with a femoral shaft fracture occurs while water skiing. He's treated with a piriformis entry anti-grade nail 
Six months later, he has persistent groin pain. What's the most likely complication? Femoral neck fracture, AVN, femoral shaft nonunion, nail breakage, or proximal locking screw cutout. And the most likely answer is going to be AVN. And that occurs because of iatrogenic injury to the lateral pipsial branches of the medial circumflex femoral artery. So let's look at the concept there. AVN of the femoral head occurs with both piriformis and greater trochanteric entry nails. So using a troch nail doesn't eliminate that complication, but it probably decreases it because you're further away of that main supply to the femoral head, which is the deep branch of the medial femoral circumflex artery. Malunion can occur after femur fractures. Here we see a fracture treated with flexible nails, and a follow-up we see a varus deformity. So it's important to watch for that and use the strongest device that you can. And then we mentioned refracture with external fixator use as a final complication. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.